chapter 6. It was a glorious morning, late spring or early summer as you care to take it, when the dainty sheen of grass and leaf is blushing to a deeper green, and the year seems like a fair young maid trembling with strange wakening pulses on the brink of womanhood. The quaint back streets of Kingston, where they came down to the water's edge, looked quite picturesque in the flashing sunlight. The glinting river with its drifting barges, the wooded towpath, the trim-kept villas on the other side. Harris, in a red and orange blazer, grunting away at the skulls. The distant glimpses of the grey old palace of the Tudors, all made a sunny picture, so bright but calm, so full of life, and yet so peaceful, that... Early in the day, though it was, I felt myself being dreamily lulled off into a musing fit. I mused on Kingston, or Kinningeston, as it was once called in the days when Saxon kingers were crowned there. Great Caesar crossed the river there, and the Roman legions camped upon its sloping uplands. Caesar, like in later years, Elizabeth, seems to have stopped everywhere, only he was more respectable than good Queen Bess. He didn't put up at the public houses. She was nuts on public houses, was England's virgin queen. There's scarcely a pub of any attractions within ten miles of London that she does not seem to have looked in at, or stopped at, or slept at, some time or other. I wonder now, supposing Harris, say, turned over a new leaf and became a great and good man and got to be Prime Minister and died, if they would put up signs over the public houses that he had patronised. Harris had a glass of bitter in this house. Harris had two of Scotch cold here in the summer of 88. Harris was chucked from here in December 1886. No, there would be too many of them. It would be the houses that he had never entered that would become famous. Only house in South London that Harris never had a drink in. The people would flock to it to see what could have been the matter with it. How poor, weak-minded King Edwy must have hated Kinningeston. The coronation feast had been too much for him. Maybe boar's head stuffed with sugar plums did not agree with him. It wouldn't with me, I know. And he had had enough of sack and mead so he slipped from the noisy revel to steal a quiet moonlight hour with his beloved El Giva. Perhaps from the casement, standing hand in hand, they were watching the calm moonlight on the river, while from the distant halls the boisterous revelry floated in broken bursts of faint-heard din and tumult. Then brutal Odo and St. Dunstan forced their rude way into the quiet room and hurled coarse insults at the sweet-faced queen and dragged poor Edwy back to the loud clamour of the drunken brawl. Years later, to the crash of battle music, Saxon kings and Saxon revelry were buried side by side, and Kingston's greatness passed away for a time to rise once more when Hampton Court became the palace of the Tudors and the Stuarts and the royal barges strained at their moorings on the river's bank, and bright-cloaked gallants swaggered down the water steps to cry, What ferry ho! Gadzooks gramercy! Many of the old houses round about speak very plainly of those days when Kingston was a royal borough, and nobles and courtiers lived there near their king, and the long road to the palace gates was gay all day with clanking steel and prancing palfreys and rustling silks and velvets and fair faces. The large and spacious houses, with their oriel latticed windows, their huge fireplaces and their gabled roofs, breathe of the days of hose and doublet, of pearl-embroidered stomachers and complicated oaths. They were upraised in the days when men knew how to build. The hard red bricks have only grown more firmly set with time, and their oak stairs do not creak and grunt when you try to go down them quietly. Speaking of oak staircases, reminds me that there is a magnificent carved oak staircase in one of the houses in Kingston. It is a shop now in the marketplace, but it was evidently once the mansion of some great personage, a friend of mine who lives at Kingston went in there to buy a hat one day and, in a thoughtless moment, put his hand in his pocket and paid for it then and there. 
The shopman, he knows my friend, was naturally a little staggered at first, but quickly recovering himself, and feeling that something ought to be done to encourage this sort of thing, asked our hero if he would like to see some fine old carved oak. My friend said he would, and the shopman thereupon took him through the shop and up the staircase of the house. The balusters were a superb piece of workmanship, and the wall all the way up was oak-panelled, with carving that would have done credit to a palace. From the stairs they went into the drawing-room, which was a large bright room decorated with a somewhat startling, though cheerful, paper of a blue ground. There was nothing, however, remarkable about the apartment, and my friend wondered why he'd been brought there. The proprietor went up to the paper and tapped it. It gave forth a wooden sound. Oak, he explained, all carved oak right up to the ceiling, just the same as you saw on the staircase. But great Caesar, man, expostulated my friend, you don't mean to say you have covered over carved oak with blue wallpaper? Yes, was the reply. It was expensive work. Had to matchboard it all over first, of course. But the room looks cheerful now. It was awful gloomy before. I can't say I altogether blame the man, which is doubtless a great relief to his mind. From his point of view, which would be that of the average householder, desiring to take life as lightly as possible, and not that of the old curiosity shop maniac, there is reason on his side. Carved oak is very pleasant to look at, and to have a little of, but it is no doubt somewhat depressing to live in for those whose fancy does not lie that way. It would be like living in a church. No, what was sad in his case was that he, who didn't care for carved oak, should have his drawing-room panelled with it, while people who do care for it have to pay enormous prices to get it. It seems to be the rule of this world. Each person has what he doesn't want and other people have what he does want. Married men have wives and don't seem to want them, and young single fellows cry out that they can't get them. Poor people who can hardly keep themselves have eight hearty children. Rich old couples with no one to leave their money to die childless. Then there are girls with lovers. The girls that have lovers never want them. They say they would rather be without them, that they bother them. And why don't they go and make love to Miss Smith and Miss Brown, who are plain and elderly and haven't got any lovers? They themselves don't want lovers. They never mean to marry. It does not do to dwell on these things. It makes one so sad. There was a boy at our school. We used to call him Sandford and Merton. His real name was Stivings. He was the most extraordinary lad I ever came across. I believe he really liked study. He used to get into awful rows for sitting up in bed and reading Greek, and as for French irregular verbs, there was simply no keeping him away from them. He was full of weird and unnatural notions about being a credit to his parents and an honour to the school, and he yearned to win prizes and grow up and be a clever man and had all those sorts of weak-minded ideas. I never knew such a strange creature, yet harmless, mind you, as the babe unborn. Well, that boy used to get ill about twice a week, so that he couldn't go to school. There never was such a boy to get ill as that Sanford and Merton. If there was any known disease going within ten miles of him, he had it, and had it badly. He would take bronchitis in the dog days, and have hay fever at Christmas. After a six-week period of drought, he would be stricken down with rheumatic fever and he would go out in a November fog and come home with a sunstroke. They put him under laughing gas one year, poor lad, and drew all his teeth and gave him a false set because he suffered so terribly with toothache. And then it turned to neuralgia and earache. He was never without a cold, except once for nine weeks when he had scarlet fever, and he always had chilblains. During the great cholera scare of 1871, our neighbourhood was singularly free from it, there was only one reputed case in the whole parish. That case was young Stivings. He had to stop in bed when he was ill and eat chicken and custards and hothouse grapes, and he would lie there and sob because they wouldn't let him do Latin exercises and took his German grammar away from him. And we other boys, who would have sacrificed ten terms of our school life for the sake of being ill for a day, and had no desire whatever to give our parents any excuse for being stuck up about us, couldn't catch so much as a stiff neck. We fooled about in draughts, and it did us good and freshened us up. 
and we took things to make us sick, and they made us fat and gave us an appetite. Nothing we could think of seemed to make us ill, until the holidays began. Then, on the breaking up day, we caught colds and whooping cough and all kinds of disorders, which lasted till the term recommenced, when, in spite of everything we could manoeuvre to the contrary, we would suddenly get well again and be better than ever. Such is life, and we are but as grass that is cut down and put into the oven and baked. To go back to the carved oak question, they must have had very fair notions of the artistic and the beautiful, our great-great-grandfathers. Why, all our art treasures of today are only the dug-up commonplaces of three or four hundred years ago. I wonder if there is real intrinsic beauty in the old soup plates, beer mugs and candle snuffers that we prize so now, or if it is only the halo of age glowing around them that gives them their charms in our eyes. The old blue that we hang about our walls as ornaments were the common everyday household utensils of a few centuries ago, and the pink shepherds and the yellow shepherdesses that we hand round now for all our friends to gush over and pretend they understand were the unvalued mantle ornaments that the mother of the 18th century would have given the baby to suck when he cried. Will it be the same in the future? Will the prized treasures of today always be the cheap trifles of the day before? Will rows of our willow pattern dinner plates be ranged above the chimney pieces of the grate in the years 2000 and odd? Will the white cups with the gold rim and the beautiful gold flower inside, species unknown that our Sarah Janes now break in sheer light heartedness of spirit, be carefully mended and stood upon a bracket and dusted only by the lady of the house? That china dog that ornaments the bedroom of my furnished lodgings, it is a white dog. Its eyes, blue. Its nose is a delicate red with black spots. Its head is painfully erect. Its expression is amiability carried to the verge of imbecility. I do not admire it myself. Considered as a work of art, I may say it irritates me. Thoughtless friends jeer at it, and even my landlady herself has no admiration for it, and excuses its presence by the circumstance that her aunt gave it to her. But in two hundred years' time, it is more than probable that the dog will be dug up from somewhere or other, minus its legs and with its tail broken, and will be sold for old china and put in a glass cabinet, and people will pass it round and admire it. They will be struck by the wonderful depth of the colour on the nose, and speculate as to how beautiful the bit of the tail that is lost no doubt was. We, in this age... Do not see the beauty of that dog. We are too familiar with it. It is like the sunset and the stars. We are not awed by their loveliness because they are common to our eyes. So it is with that china dog. In 2,288, people will gush over it. The making of such dogs will have become a lost art. Our descendants will wonder how we did it and say how clever we were. We shall be referred to lovingly as those grand old artists that flourished in the 19th century and produced those china dogs. The sampler that the eldest daughter did at school will be spoken of as tapestry of the Victorian era and will be almost priceless. The blue and white mugs of the present-day roadside inn will be hunted up, all cracked and chipped, and sold for their weight in gold, and rich people will use them for claret cups, and travellers from Japan will buy up all the presents from Ramsgate and souvenirs of Margate that may have escaped destruction and taken them back to Jado as ancient English curios. At this point, Harris threw away the skulls, got up and left his seat, and sat on his back and stuck his legs in the air. Montmorency howled and turned a somersault, and the top hamper jumped up and all the things came out, I was somewhat surprised, but I did not lose my temper. I said, pleasantly enough, Hello, what's that for? What's that for? Why... No, on second thoughts, I will not repeat what Harris said. I may have been to blame, I admit it, but nothing excuses violence of language and coarseness of expression, especially in a man who has been carefully brought up, as I know Harris has been. 
I was thinking of other things, and forgot, as anyone might easily understand, that I was steering, and the consequence was that we'd got mixed up a good deal with the towpath. It was difficult to say for the moment which was us and which was the Middlesex bank of the river, but we found out after a while and separated ourselves. Harris, however, said he had done enough for a bit and proposed that I should take a turn. So, as we were in, I got out and took the tow-line and ran the boat on past Hampton Court. What a dear old wall that is that runs along by the river there. I never pass it without feeling better for the sight of it. Such a mellow, bright, sweet old wall. What a charming picture it would make, with the lichen creeping here and the moss growing there, a shy young vine peeping over the top at this spot to see what is going on upon the busy river and the sober old ivy clustering a little further down. There are fifty shades and tints and hues in every ten yards of that old wall. If I could only draw and knew how to paint, I could make a lovely sketch of that old wall, I'm sure. I've often thought I should like to live at Hampton Court. It looks so peaceful and so quiet, and it is such a dear old place to ramble round in the early morning before many people are about. But there, I don't suppose I should really care for it when it came to actual practice. It would be so ghastly dull and depressing in the evening, when your lamp cast uncanny shadows on the panelled walls, and the echo of distant feet rang through the cold stone corridors, and now drew nearer, and now died away, and all was death-like silence, save the beating of one's own heart. We are creatures of the sun, we men and women. We love light and life. That is why we crowd into the towns and cities, and the country grows more and more deserted every year. In the sunlight, in the daytime, when nature is alive and busy all around us, we like the open hillsides and the deep woods well enough. But in the night, when our mother earth has gone to sleep and left us waking, oh, the world seems so lonesome, and we get frightened, like children in a silent house. Then we sit and sob and long for the gaslit streets and the sound of human voices and the answering throb of human life. We feel so helpless and so little in the great stillness when the dark trees rustle in the night wind. There are so many ghosts about, and their silent sighs make us feel so sad. Let us gather together in the great cities and light huge bonfires of a million gas jets and shout and sing together and feel brave. Harris asked me if I'd ever been in the maze at Hampton Court. He said he went in once to show somebody else the way. He'd studied it up in a map, and it was so simple that it seemed foolish, hardly worth the tuppence charged for admission. Harris said he thought that map must have been got up as a practical joke, because it wasn't a bit like the real thing, and only misleading. It was a country cousin that Harris took in. He said, "'We'll just go in here so that you can say you've been, but it's very simple.' It's absurd to call it a maze. You keep on taking the first turning to the right. We'll just walk round for ten minutes and then go and get some lunch. They met some people soon after they had got inside who said they had been there for three quarters of an hour and had had about enough of it. Harris told them that they could follow him if they liked. He was just going in and then should turn round and come out again. They said it was very kind of him and fell behind and followed. They picked up various other people who wanted to get it over as they went along, until they had absorbed all the persons in the maze. People who had given up all hopes of ever getting either in or out, or of ever seeing their home and friends again, plucked up courage at the sight of Harris and his party, and joined the procession, blessing him. Harris said he should judge there must have been twenty people following him in all, and one woman with a baby who had been there all the morning insisted on taking his arm for fear of losing him. Harris kept on turning to the right, but it seemed a long way, and his cousin said he supposed it was a very big maze. Oh, one of the largest in Europe, said Harris. Well, yes, it must be, replied the cousin, because we've walked a good two miles already. Harris began to think it rather strange himself, but he held on until 
At last, they passed the half of a penny bun on the ground that Harris's cousin swore he had noticed there seven minutes ago. Harris said, Oh, impossible. But the woman with the baby said, Not at all, as she herself had taken it from the child and thrown it down there just before she met Harris. She also added that she wished she never had met Harris and expressed an opinion that he was an impostor. That made Harris mad, and he produced his map and explained his theory. The map may be all right enough, said one of the party, if you know whereabouts in it we are now. Harris didn't know and suggested that the best thing to do would be to go back to the entrance and begin again. For the beginning again part of it, there was not much enthusiasm, but with regard to the advisability of going back to the entrance, there was complete unanimity, and so they turned and trailed after Harris again in the opposite direction. About ten minutes more passed, and then they found themselves in the centre. Harris thought at first of pretending that that was what he had been aiming at, but the crowd looked dangerous, and he decided to treat it as an accident. Anyhow, they had got something to start from then. They did know where they were, and the map was once more consulted, and the thing seemed simpler than ever, and off they started for the third time. And three minutes later they were back in the centre again. After that they simply couldn't get anywhere else. Whatever way they turned brought them back to the middle. It became so regular at length that some of the people stopped there and waited for the others to take a walk round and come back to them. Harris drew out his map again after a while, but the sight of it only infuriated the mob, and they told him to go and curl his hair with it. Harris said that he couldn't help feeling that, to a certain extent, he had become unpopular. They all got crazy at last and sang out for the keeper, and the man came and climbed up the ladder outside and shouted out directions to them. But all their heads were by this time in such a confused whirl that they were incapable of grasping anything, and so the man told them to stop where they were and he would come to them. They huddled together and waited, and he climbed down and came in. He was a young keeper, as luck would have it, and new to the business, and when he got in he couldn't find them, and he wandered about trying to get to them, and then he got lost. They caught sight of him every now and then, rushing about the other side of the hedge, and he would see them and rush to get them, and they would wait there for about five minutes, and then he would reappear again in exactly the same spot and ask them where they had been. They had to wait till one of the old keepers came back from his dinner before they got out. Harris said he thought it was a very fine maze, so far as he was a judge, and we agreed that we would try to get George to go into it on our way back. 